All right, you're good. Uh, Whiskey, Warriors, Hurt Locker, Teamwork, John Epps. You got the team here, brother. Ready, set, go. Over to you. Great. Audio is good, yep. Awesome. All right, so, um, you know, unfortunately, you started the recording after you gave that quick story about General Kyle Ellison. Um, and I'm really happy that you mentioned what he said at the end of that conversation. Um, I was listening to something recently, and this is not anything that I prepared, so I'm going to go just real quick off cuff. Um, Simon Sinek, if you guys have ever read anything by Simon Sinek, uh, he wrote a book called Start With Why. Got a lot of great podcasts out there, and I'll probably be dropping a ton of knowledge on you guys uh, during this. And if I mention something, if you don't get a chance to write it down, just go back to Captain Morano, and uh, he can ask me, hey, what was that thing that you said? And I'll, I'll feel free to share show notes or whatever on the back end just because I feel like you guys need to be as professionally learning as possible uh, regardless of what it is, military stuff, non-military stuff, and I'll talk about that in a second. Um, but I was listening to this podcast by Simon Sinek. Simon Sinek was talking to a guy that he met when he was in Vegas doing a talk, and this guy was working at a coffee shop, and uh, this guy was, he was a character, he was able to carry on a great conversation. He seemed uh, supremely satisfied with what he was doing, just working at a coffee shop in Vegas. And uh, Simon Sinek, as the inquisitive guy that he is, just said, you know, hey, what do you like about your job? Um, and the guy started off by saying, I love my job. He didn't say he just liked it. And so for a guy that's uh, as inquisitive uh, as Simon Sinek, saying that you love something is a higher level order of thinking. It's a higher level order of emotion. And uh, I like how you put that, you know, that General Ellison closed the conversation that way. I know he wouldn't just say it to me. He would say it to all the Marines that served in 2-6. We had a very tough deployment. Uh, we shed a lot of blood together. We lost a lot of Marines together. A lot of dudes got injured. Uh, much of that was kind of overshadowed by 3-5. He was up in Sangin fighting a really difficult fight. Uh, and they started about halfway into our deployment. But at the time when we went over to Marja, it was extremely difficult. So we formed a brotherhood that's, you know, it's, it's never going to be recreated on any level and still hasn't to this day. So it means that brotherhood that was formed with the guys of 2nd County 6 Marines which is right over my uh, left shoulder. That's a uh, plaque that was given to me. Um, you know, it's not my, I love you all. I was joking with Josh. This is just, you know, where I eat steel as much as possible. So uh, you just got to put some stuff up that reminds you about what, what matters, right? Uh, so that matters. And uh, I, I would say to you guys, you know, if, if you don't look around the room and you can't say to somebody within your unit that you love them, I would kind of ask you why. Why can't you say that? Um, you should be comfortable being able to say that. Uh, so if comfortability is part of it, that's something that I would question. Uh, but then also, if you're comfortable saying it, but you don't say it, um, why not? Is your team not effective? Um, is your relationship not effective with the people that are around you? I feel like in the organization that we're in with what we're charged to do and the sacrifice that we give up, love should definitely be a part of that. Uh, so don't hesitate to do that. So I kind of use that as an opener, and we'll talk about a lot of the things that make teamwork effective and make teamwork great. Um, and I know I ask a lot of you guys, or maybe not a lot, for those of you that are voracious readers or watchers of podcasts, videos, et cetera, but I just kind of wanted to set the stage. And Josh hooked me up with a little survey of some questions that I wanted uh, that I wanted you guys to take care of beforehand, and I can't wait to get into some of the responses because those were more fantastic than I could have imagined, and it's, it's going to spark some good conversation. Uh, so first and foremost, uh, just to say, completely honored to be a part of this. Uh, Josh, for you to ask me to do something like this uh, is really awesome for me personally. You know, you always step up for a brother or sister that asks you to do something like this, and, you know, hopefully you've been thinking about something like this for a long time. Uh, but for me, you know, I've been running and gunning for a really long time. I've had the pleasure to do, you know, many fantastic deployments at some conventional Marine Corps units and then some high-speed organizations as well. But um, what I've found and what I'll talk about here a little bit later is, you know, I haven't really had the time to sit down and do a ton of reflection. So reflection is one of the things that I've kind of added into my repertoire and one of the one of the things that I'll leave you with. Uh, if you're not doing it, you absolutely need to do it. And, um, you know, if you're, not a, if you're not a note taker, write this down. If you're a note taker, write this down. This is one of the big things that's going to come from this conversation these days. Um, you know, the I and team, that's one of the things that we're going to talk about today. Uh, it's just going to be one of the underlying themes that I'm going to get to later on, but the I and team is something that 
kind of being talked about a little bit more and reflection is absolutely a part of that. Um, and we'll get to that when we get to the question of who makes up the team. Um, but to all the guys that are in the room, uh, besides Josh, you know, thanks for what you guys are doing. I know it might seem, might seem a little thankless, uh, where you guys are at right now, sitting in some pretty sweet barracks that you guys have put your propaganda up on the wall. Um, although you're not in the fight right now and you guys probably wish that you were sitting in some trench somewhere in the Donbass region or over in Maripol and you guys were fighting the Russians. Um, I think arguably our country is doing what it needs to be doing right now. And you guys are right where you need to be. You guys are part of the integrated deterrent strategy. And that's extremely important for the nation. So don't, don't downplay what you're doing and how important that is. So with regards to the reading list and the stuff that I gave you guys, I mean, it's, it's all about making yourself knowledgeable. So I just wanted to just litter a couple things out there to spark some conversation. But the reason why I bring it up is because if you're not doing that for yourself personally, if you're not doing that within your team, you're doing both yourself and your team a disservice. So continue to develop yourselves and cash your net as widely as possible. You guys have got to be a part of what we call the profession of arms. And if you're going to be within the profession of arms, you need to study the profession of arms. And by that, I mean, obviously, drill down into the doctrine. We the concept for standing forces. We need Force Design 2030. Understand what talent management 2030 means to the Marine Corps and where the Marine Corps is going. But more than that, cash net as widely as possible. So, you know, I gave you a, I gave you a video to watch of a guy that uh, he does a bunch of leadership talks. I gave you a video to watch um, from another guy that does some leadership uh Leadership stuff. I gave you two articles to read. Um, one was from Carol Dweck, which we'll talk about her a little bit later. She's at Stanford. Um, and then I gave you, uh, you know, the survey to do uh, amongst some other things. So just make sure you're casting that wide. It doesn't have to be all Marine Corps stuff. It doesn't have to be all military stuff. It needs to be other stuff because you need to develop yourself as a man or a woman just as much as you develop yourself as a Marine. It's extremely, extremely important. So, Jack, big up for the survey. Um, Word of advice from the survey before we get into some of the stuff from the survey later. You know, I, I spent a lot of time going through some of the stuff that was come back on the survey, and I and I saw that some of you guys were phoning it in. I get it. Like somebody hands you a survey, and you're like, oh god, another survey. You guys are going to take hundreds of surveys in your in your lives in the DOD. Uh, some of them are going to be more important than others. Uh, for this one, this is really important for me. Uh, so I think that this survey, after we give this talk, after we talk about some of the things. I think it might be fruitful to go back and do that survey again. I'll tell you one of my theories that I have from uh, some of the feedback that we got from it, but some surveys are more important than others. This one's a big one uh, because this one's going to help you develop yourselves as a team. So to Josh and the leaders, uh, take this survey, expand upon the survey, do the survey again, do it with a different audience, see what you get. Um, and, you know, it can be, maybe be a useful tool for you in the future. So I had, a, I had a ton of time to prepare for this. Uh, luckily, you know, I kind of got kicked back. Uh, currently, I'm in command and staff right now. I'm at the Crossroads of the Marine Corps up in Quantico. Uh, and all I've been doing for the past eight months of my life has been reading and writing. And that's it. And it's something that I haven't done in a very long time. It's been extremely challenging at first. But you know what? I did Like, I got better at it. And I'm getting a whole lot better at it. And I'm thankful for that opportunity. Um, and it's given me a lot of time to reflect. When Josh asked me to talk about teamwork, I tried to sit down first, and I was like, what have I thought about teamwork the entire time I've been here? And unfortunately for me, I haven't thought about it a lot. So that's a challenge that I was willing to accept, very appreciative of, and I'm really happy uh, that I was given that challenge because now I get to share some of the things that I feel like are truly important and hopefully they make an impact, and I can kind of imprint on you guys as you're going forward. So speaking of teamwork, just some initial thoughts, and forgive me if I don't look at the camera the whole time, I got pages and pages of notes uh, that I'm trying to get through here, uh, but it's definitely going to get kicked over to you guys. So, you know, ROE, standing ROE, so this is the exact same as it has been. If you got something to say, like, unmute your damn mic, get on the net, and make sure you're saying it, because I want your feedback, and I don't want to talk the whole time. You can hear I got a pretty raspy voice. A lot of people talk to me about my raspy voice. A lot of people love my raspy voice. If I talk the whole time, I'll be completely mute by the time. Oh, God. Yeah, go we, ahead, Josh. We call, it, we call it sultry, not raspy. Like, it's <laughs> give yourself some perks. You're good. Yeah, one, one of the good things about it is uh, when I get on the net, if it's on Green Gear, everybody knows who's talking to uh, There's There's no confusion that, uh, that John Epps is on the mic. Uh, so, and, and there's some initial thoughts on teamwork. Um, so, teamwork has changed 
significantly, uh, especially over the past few years. Um, and for me, through the course of my career, being a member of a team or being a leader of a team has changed significantly from the time that I went in the Marine Corps in 2005 to the time that I'm here today. Uh, you know, what, what's changed in the past couple of years? I think technology is a huge thing that has changed the way that we lead our teams, the way that we operate with our teams. I mean, you know, we're sitting here on a, uh, a WebEx meet or a Google meet or whatever the hell, you know, technology this is right now. But that was not a thing when I was coming up. It was either a text message and then texting turned into, you know, group text messages. And then it turned into Slack. And then it turned into something else. And that's, that's the way that we learned how to communicate with our teams and spread knowledge, spread collaboration, spread innovation. So it's changed a ton. Social media is a huge piece of that. And so there's been, there's been a lot of technological impacts to the way that you can lead a team. Uh, the takeaway there is let technology be your aid and don't let it be a hindrance and just accept it. Like it is going to happen. Just with every technological impact that's happening and changing the character of war right now, just accept it, figure out how you can utilize it uh, to leverage your team. Uh, the, second, the second big thing that I feel like has changed the way that you know, teamwork is in the Marine Corps, or teamwork is period, is who makes up the formation. So whether that's in the Marine Corps, whether that's in your family, whether that's your friend group, it's just changed significantly. Uh, you know, we were BSing before we started this. I was, was you know, riffing on my sister real quick because she's getting ready to get married. She's eight years my junior, um, and she's still a millennial. But, I mean, you know, who a battalion commander, who a commander of my rank as an 04 as a major leads right now has changed significantly. So you need to think about who's in your formation. Uh, what their likes are, what their dislikes are, who they are as a person, um, and just how they operate as an individual. That's changed significantly. Uh, you know, you get your millennials now, and you get your Gen Z, or in which you're 97 to 2012, those that were born in there, and that's kind of the formation that's coming in, making up the e, E1 to the E3 ranks. Uh, and that, that's a big deal. Like, it's, it's, it's a massive change uh, from what used to be. And then I think the last thing, and this is very specific to the Marine Corps, is our doctrine is really changing the way that teams are going to operate in the future. You know, if, if you're if you're a corporal or below and they're in your formation, I know we're talking more staff and peers and officers than anybody else. If they're not reading some of the Marine Corps doc, doctrine and publications and they're not kind of diving into that, they need to really think about that. We're talking about, you know, a concept for standing forces, integrated deterrence, uh, how you guys operate it. Am I still on? I had a guy just call me real quick. I'm good? Okay, thanks. Um, it's, cha it's changed a lot of the way that we do business. Um, so that, that Marine Corps doctrine, you got to dig into it. You got to see what that means to your formation. As a weapons company, you guys operate non-traditionally uh, to the conventional Marine Corps. And so you got to figure out how you fit into that. Uh, so much like many of the warfighters that are presented before me, and I'm thankful to have gone back and watched all those talks, um, I look forward to some of this back and forth as we get into it. Uh, but like I said, you know, it's only as fruitful as those that are willing to engage. So, so please engage as we're going through this. All right, so kind of getting to that first question that I asked you guys, which was, you know, without looking at a definition of teamwork, write down three things or phrases that do not um, highlight to you what effective teamwork is. I was, I was reading something uh, recently which led to this question, and, and it was about strategic communication. And uh, the, the person that gave it, her, her name is Rosa Brooks. She's a Georgetown law professor. And she was, uh, she was on a panel that was supposed to help out define what strategic communication is within uh, the Department of Defense and within the Department of Defense dealing with civilians. And she said it was much easier to define what strategic communication is not versus define what strategic communication is. And I thought that would probably be a pretty good point to start at. So, so what's teamwork not? So instead of like asking everybody to give their, you know, inputs, I'll, I'll tell you what I pulled out of the survey. So there were, there were three big themes that came across in the outlier, and, and then there were some outliers as well. And I'm going to pull on the outliers because I want some people to kind of talk about their responses a little bit. So if it was you, um, be the guy, stand up and, uh, and say, you know, what you had to say in that instance, that, that would be appreciated. So the three big themes were, number one was communication. And some people put some caveats in there, such as lack of communication, poor communication, or inefficient communication. And I'll definitely agree with that. And we saw the inverse of that when we talked about effective teams. It was, you know, solid communication, 
uh, communication that flows freely, people willing to communicate. That was one of the inverse things that came up for the next question. Uh, the, the second thing that came up was selfishness. Uh, one of the things that came out, and, I, and I'm kind of bucketing these together, uh, was, quote, putting your career over your Marines. Definitely a selfish aspect. Uh, some of the things that also came about that I'll bucket into selfishness were um, some character traits such as arrogance, pride, ego, selfishness, vanity, being narcissistic all very sharp terms that I thought were very good to bring about because if that exists within your organization, you know, you're not, you're not going to be able to get over that hurdle easy. It's very difficult. And I've got a personal story that I'll share later into, you know, some of those things that presented themselves within one of the teams that I worked in. On the, on the ego part, uh, a book, write it down. Ego is your enemy. Ryan Holiday, great book. Write that one down. Ryan Holiday has got also some other stuff. Get it on Audible, listen to it while you're running, uh, read it, margin note it, and uh, just take some lessons away from it. Uh, Ryan Holiday, great author, very good stuff, very, uh, very uh, career-oriented individual, not in, the, not in the Marine Corps, outside of the Marine Corps, outside of service. And the last one, so the third one was uh, trust, and this was specifically mentioned in terms of like dishonesty. If you're dishonest, it's going to ruin the trust within your organization. So there's your three big themes for the first question. What is not effective teamwork? Lack of communication or inefficient communication, selfishness, and all of those character traits that I, that I talked about, and then lack of trust. There's your three right there. So some of the outliers that came about that I love, uh, the first one, uh, somebody put drama. Very, very strong word. One word, drama. Okay? So, you know, you walk into a room, you want zero drama. You don't want to bring any of that in. Uh, you want zero ego as well. Uh, but who wrote down drama? And whoever wrote down drama, just give me a little bit more than just that one word. Give me a couple sentences. Maybe it could be an anecdote. Maybe it could be something that you've experienced within this team or within another team. Or maybe it's something that you've seen in Hollywood. Maybe it's something that you've seen in literature. Why drama? And if I got to go back into the survey and find who printed, damn it, I'll make you guys wait. I saw somebody pointing. Somebody next to the soda machine's point is like, you did it. You're the one. I got some weights here. I can just do some curls in the meantime if you want. I'm about to dumpster dive this survey for you and just cold call them. Uh, so as they're deciding whether they want to talk, they probably forget what they put. They were probably drunk when they did it, but I'll help them. So if they can't come to it, I'll, I'll inspire their memory. Hold on. I'm going to, I'm going to go in, but guys, whoever put it, um, your response for the three things was drama lack of respect and weak leadership. And we're sort of punting around with you a little bit. Like if you can't remember that's, I actually will pull it because that is an interesting response. So if you really don't recall, totally cool, but I am gonna pull it because that's a great response and you guys had some good stuff. So I will try to find who it was, John. Brandon, can you hear us? I just saw you log in, dude. Brandon Gibson. Yes, sir. Sorry, dude. Um, so yeah, I had to sign off my phone and get on my computer and I'm trying to get my video up, but you know how technology works. I think, uh, I, I don't, don't kind of neither, on that. I don't know how it works and apparently neither do you, which is our problem. Yeah, no, 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 yeah. absolutely we not. We can't see and your bearded face. Uh, and, and, inject it's, real and it's quick. comical because, you know, I work in uh, a little bit of technology and that's comical to me. You do. Hey guys. So, uh, Brandon Gibson is, I think out of, so John Epps, Brandon Gibson, CJ Santa were the only three people aside from my wife and my oldest daughter that were present for my pinning to captain. We all went up to the Horno Crosses. Uh, John was a promoting officer because he at the time was a captain out with recon. Uh, CJ Santa Maw, who's now retired, was a first sergeant. We served as staff and COs together. And Brandon was in Afghanistan animation with me in 2008 when, oddly enough, we were supporting 2-7 down in Nazad, Bastion. Yeah all over God's green earth and hilly earth as well. So Brandon's one of my oldest brothers on the NCO side of the house. 
Um, he did CI human stuff. He's now out uh, doing some other nifty things on the uh, contractor side of the house. But if you see his bearded face login, that's who that is. So if CJ joins as well, these are three of my dearest brothers, which is why they were present. So Brandon actually pinned me. My wife, Laura, pinned me. CJ read the thing as the first sergeant. John was a promoting officer. And I had my baby girl strapped to a baby carrier on the front of me. Um, it was a really cool experience. But I say that because, like, that was a really important special moment. And Brandon loves John. So he's like, yo, I made John in. But, uh, yeah. Uh, Dude, John, I was, I was, so, I was so I was so darn excited to come here and see John again. I mean, that, that hike up the cross is um, – <clears throat> Wasn't really uh, my best showing, but uh, hey, sometimes we have to uh, make improvements and uh, make our way up there. But John, great, great to hear from you, man. Yeah, and you, brother. I'm gonna, John. I'm gonna let you keep going. I'm gonna keep, I'm gonna keep looking through to find that, but I'm not gonna uh, still make your progress, progress either, dude. No issues. Um, you know, it, it's funny that you know one of the three big uh, factors that came out of this question was communication and uh i highlighted lack of communication poor communication inefficient communication uh prior to brandon speaking and you trying to fill the dead air josh i would say we're having lack of communication poor communication and inefficient communication if we're not able to sit here and actually have an honest discussion with ourselves that's that's one of the biggest pieces gentlemen i mean if, if you're going to sit here and you're going to talk about effective teamwork and you're going to write down a survey, which, of course, was anonymous, but we can go back and find out, you know, who said it. Be willing to step up and be willing to say, yeah, that was me. I'm the guy that put it down. And this is what drama means to me. And, and this is why it cannot be a part of the team. So I'll pivot off of that one. And I'll, I'll just give you the pass real quick. And I'll keep going. But I, I will say that, you know, if, if you want to make ground, if you want to be better, which arguably all of you in this room should, if you don't, you know, check the hell out and go find another organization to be a part of, like break the dead air, be willing to talk. Well, I'm going to, I'm going to inject, I'm going to inject real quick. So you're not allowed to pivot just yet. Respectfully. Okay. But we're like standing at attention when we rebut what you say, because you outrank all of us, but I'm going to debo it. Uh, I don't care who put it, but if you think no one's wearing rank, go, go do like, <laughs> clean and or something for a second behind you uh hey if you would concur with drama in whatever sense that means to you even if you weren't the one to put it if that resonates with you and you're like hey uh save the drama for your mama i don't want no scrubs whatever brandon you know what yeah whiskey didn't want to respond brandon your experience in teamwork since these guys are getting cold feet give a quick uh snapshot of what you think for drama related to teamwork oh we got a uh, hey andrew go ahead brother and then when you're done Brandon, I'll ask you if you want to chime in real quick, and then from yeah, there, no worries. jump off. What you got, dude? Uh, Andrew it's first, good. and Brandon after. Uh, Major Epps, Lieutenant Fennell, I'm Machine Up Team Commander. Uh, I think maybe what the person who submitted it was probably getting at, like teams need to be able to make the most effective decisions as fast as they can. Uh, having drama in the organization impedes that process and probably degrades the bonds of trust uh, that make – things happen quickly. Yeah, Rad, that's, that's a really good response. Brandon, we'll kick it over to you and then I'll, I'll close that one out. Yeah, I'll, um, I didn't know, I didn't know we were using our made up name. So uh, I'm uh, Brandon Gibson, Rush Shaman, damn glad to meet you. <clears throat> I'm kidding folks, come on. We need a little comedy in this. Um, I, I'm gonna go with exactly how he presented it as well. Um, if you have drama in your team, well, you know, whether that presents itself as teamwork or the result of not teamwork because of that drama, I think it has to do with how you get along and how you manage. And, and this is me looking at it from a different point, but it's how you manage the people that work with and for you. And I think that's uh, two points that I know John will cover because he's much smarter than me. Um, but uh, make sure that you have a way to communicate with your, uh, the people that work with and for you because everyone's different. You need to make a plan uh, to be able to lead people the way they need to be uh, led. And that kind of goes into uh, learning and how people uh, take in information. So you have to be prepared as a leader to present things, not only in the kinetic form, hands-on, but also verbally and uh, um the other types of learning, sorry, in my mind kind of skipped me. I've been about 13 meetings today. Um, and I think 
I think the drama com- the, the drama itself comes from not knowing how to lead those around you um, correctly and their way of learning and their way of leadership or following the leader. But that's just my side of it. I'll turn it back to John. Yeah, John, I got a, I got, I got a quick thing that this just spurred in my mind as well. So my grandma, Murano, my dad's mom used to say this a lot. So she came over from Belgium. My dad's dad came over from Italy. He was in the Navy. He made chief in seven years. Then he got out, worked for like GM up in Detroit and raised all of my dad and his brothers and sisters. So pretty cool story on like, you know, first generation immigrants coming over, serving our country and then like trying to raise a good family. She was super wise, man. She was a concert pianist, ridiculous uh, skill. And then she just became a housewife and such a phenomenal woman. Her name was Adelphine uh, Templar and changed her name to Murano. And I gave you that because it like personalizes who she was to me, just such a dear grandma. You could smell her like baking cannolis and making lasagna. His grandpa was sipping on whiskey and smoking a stogie in the back down in Florida for big. Dude, sign me up. That sounds excellent. Yeah, it was so good, man. And I remember all these things, but grandma used to say to us, and she said it to us as kids, but I think it applies. Um, she said it to us as kids as all of us cousins were playing. And some of the things that she would say, and I know this sounds like a tongue in cheek, like, oh, you've had time to develop this and make it sound good. Promise you verbatim, she would say it. Uh, If we were all like arguing and someone was like injecting in another argument with the other cousins or whatever, she would look at us and say, if you're not a part of the solution, stop making yourself part of the problem and go play by yourself, Josh. And I think as a leader, that is so profound as I've grown in wisdom and understanding as a person, even if it's not a dramatic situation as a leader. If I inject myself somewhere where I can't actually solve that or where maybe I should allow others to solve it at a minimum, I make it more convoluted at a maximum. I make it ridiculously dramatic. And if, if I'm not a part of the solution, maybe I shouldn't inject myself to the equation. And uh, even if you're not a dramatic person, you can cause drama by just misplacing yourself into situations or problem sets where you can be aware of it, but you probably don't need your hands in it. Uh, so yeah, that's a shout out to Grandma Dell, which was just resounded by my father and mother growing up. But I think uh, that stuff I've heard as a kid sort of just hit me. So there you go, back over to you. Yeah, that's uh, all good input from everybody. Um, you know, I, I like the uh, I like the drama piece. Um, I think we can all share a story with regards to drama. I think one of the most important things, and Josh, you brought in leadership, and I'll just, you know, pause for effect real quick. Like, we're all leaders in the room, and we need to be thinking about this from a leadership context. Um, so a leader's got to understand what's drama and what's not drama. Uh, there's always going to be issues that come up. How you deal with those issues, you can turn them into drama, uh, or you can just accept them and move on with them. You know, somebody having a, an issue with his family, that's not drama. Uh, somebody bringing that issue with his family into the workplace um, through his emotions and pushing it into some other problem, that could end up turning into drama. But you as a leader just need to understand how to deal with that situation. So what's drama, what's not drama, I think that's something that we can sit around and talk about. Um, but the drama piece I thought was really important. I thought the person that was writing it, he was probably getting at, if somebody's going to start drama within his formation, start drama within his circle, make something into something greater than it needs to be. I think that's you are kind of getting there. And really all comes back to being distracted. You, you don't want to be distracted. And, and from, you know, your core documents that you pushed out, Josh, you talk about being mission-oriented, mission-focused, and focusing on the specific thing that we're here for as a team. You know, if it's not going to go towards that, just make sure that you can separate that and not be distracted. So I think that's really important. Um, be, beyond the Beyond the responses that I got, uh, one of the things that I asked you guys to watch was uh, Patrick Lencioni. He was talking about, you know, the the three things that make up, you know, your team members, the HHS. Um, and he also has another video out there. You feel free to go watch it. It's on YouTube. And he talks about the five dysfunctions of a team. It's actually a book that he wrote as well. And so here's what he says in terms of the five dysfunctions of a team that can detract away from the team being great. Number one is selfishness. Number two is no peer-to-peer accountability. Number three is lack of commitment. Number four is fear of conflict. And number five is absence of trust. So we'll talk about a couple of those things as we keep on going. Um, But at this point in time, I'm going to transition to, you know, what we think about effective teamwork is. 
Come on, bro. You can come through. You want to say what's up to everybody on the meet? What's up, guys? What's up, girlfriend? Looking good. My daughter just came back in from longboarding. You know, no big deal. Just raising some cool kids around here. So uh, transitioning, like, what, what is effective teamwork? Um, so similar to you guys, uh, since I'm here at Command and Staff, you know, I'm surrounded by O4s. I got a bunch of O5s that are teaching the classroom. Uh, art uh, for our faculty advisors and then a bunch of PhDs as well. So I asked a lot of these same questions to them to see if I would get anything different. Um, here's some of the stuff that people said from my class as far as like words or phrases uh, for effective teamwork. They came up with a uh, group working towards an end goal, unselfish, unity, joint, necessary. I thought it was a good one. Teamwork is necessary. Group thought was one that came up in terms of something that happens within a team. Discipline, communication. Uh, somebody said bullshit. That's what they said. That was the first word that came to their mind when I said teamwork. He was an Air Force officer. He was a pilot. So we're just going to use that as an outlier, okay? Uh, communication, strategy, cooperation, collaboration. Marine Corps is what one of the PhDs said. So this is a non-uniformed individual. They said Marine Corps is teamwork. Somebody said dream work, of course, can't get beyond teamwork without dream work. And the last person said working things out. I thought that was pretty interesting. Um, and, and, I, and I go back to some of the things that you guys said. So we talked about the inverse and the converse between the first two questions. Uh, 13 of you guys said communication. So that's near half of everybody that was told said communication was something that was absolutely necessary for an effective team. Why? Um, why? Somebody said why? Me, um, Brandon, I, I, I would like an explanation of why 13 people said why, because I think that is the biggest point that one from looking from the outside Monday morning quarterback. Why was that your biggest thing? And tell me how we can improve it. And that, and that, and that is completely for me. And John, I apologize, but that is super important. I think it's a great point. Yeah, I, I asked for injection, so I'm glad somebody's jumping on the mic besides you and Josh. I mean, we're just having a little freeway here. Everybody else is just watching, so I don't know. Hey, man, I'll, so, I'll jump in anytime. If every, all, everyone else doesn't want to talk, I'll talk. Come on now. So as you guys are thinking about jumping on the mic, here, here are some things to prime you. Besides communication, here are some of the other words that you guys use that I bucketed into the communication responses. Nonverbal communication. Implicit communication. Communication through hardship, hearing one another and listening to each other. Those were a couple of things that I pulled out that, that I thought was severely important. And just like you, Brandon, I think this is the most obvious answer to me. And this is one of the most important answers to me. And I try and foster this wherever I go. Communication absolutely has to be something at the forefront of your mind, whether you're the lowest view on the ladder, whether you're the highest view on the ladder. If you can communicate, if you can make the pitch, you can get the job no matter what. So I'm going to go back to one of the ones that I just say and see if anybody will jump on the mic and kind of talk about it. Somebody put down communicate through hardship. If that was you and you remember, you know, feel free to jump on it. And if not, if you can think about what does communication through hardship mean to you and jump on the mic and just throw your, throw your thoughts out there. Snipers, I'm going to go over to you. Uh, do you do a former sniper platoon commander some proud and just jump start it? I got my own thoughts, but let's jog uh, back I, more from y'all. I'll so. jump in too, Josh. If you need someone to jump in, I can absolutely talk about this, but um, yeah, I don't so, want it to be, as John said, a, a wonderful three way. Yeah, I, I doubt you on that, but thanks. Uh, yeah, so like, so over to you guys. Uh, just give your thoughts, man, and there's no wrong answer, but let's jump start the combo. Sir, Lieutenant DeWitt, uh, Star Platoon Commander. So when I think communication through hardship, uh, I think I, I, I take that more as communicating during difficult situations. Um, so keeping up, you know, it, it's easily to effectively communicate with people around you when everybody's warm and dry and uh, well rested. But the more stress is input into the system, um, I think communication just naturally becomes much more difficult. Uh, and so I think seeing how a team communicates during a stressful situation is a really good metric to see 
how it, how that team communicates kind of kind of as a whole. You win, you guys, you make your guys do stretch shoots. Yes, sir. So uh, give me one of the shooter spotter pairs. I don't care if it's a shooter. I don't care if it's a spotter. Okay. Talk to me about what you need to do during a stress shoot, which I would say is communication through hardship, whether that's you. You make you guys PT before they get on the glass, or, you know, you make you guys go through some sort of 10 game before they get on the glass, you know, they knock down some steel. And then uh, talk to me about how you can effectively communicate through hardship to accomplish your goal. You're still unmuted. You're unmuted. Okay. Uh, Sean Corey and Corbel Fireball, uh, two of those three seventeens in the platoon. Um, I definitely say one of the biggest things is saying clear and concise messages, just like radio etiquette. Um, say what you mean and say nothing else. Uh, that's kind of the biggest thing. Uh, don't beat around the bush while you're trying to get out. Otherwise, rounds aren't going to hit steel. Rounds aren't going to hit their target. So that's my biggest thing. Is just say what you mean. What you got, mustache? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, I absolutely agree with that. Uh, one of the biggest things is, especially if when you're on glass, uh, make sure you just calm down your shooter, right? Um, I, I agree with exactly what he said. Just say what you mean. Um, but at the same time, it's also a matter of knowing who your shooter is and able to, like, understanding how he's going to handle the situation, whether it's he's under time, his heart rate's high as shit, um, you know, he could have just ran up a flight of stairs. He has one round. Uh, it's that 500 yards or 500 meters, whatever. Um, it's one of those things where you have to know your boy. You have to understand, like, what he's feeling at the time so that you can actually say, you know, you can say, hey, man, take a second, pause, breathe, natural, you know, natural respiratory pause, natural point of aim, you know, just be on target, right? Um, so, yeah, just know who you're working with and uh, know your guys. Yeah, you know, it's a really good answer uh, from the two of you, and thanks for stepping up uh, and really breaking the ice there. So clear and concise communication, absolutely. You know, what's the message that you're trying to transmit, and who, who is the audience that you're transmitting to, I think is absolutely important. And another thing that you said, fireball or whatever weird call sign you have, um, which is great. I love call signs. Um, but That's, that's his name. His last name is Fireball. Oh, that's rad. That's yeah. super rad. His father gave him his call sign. Okay, rock and roll. Hey, I'm here for that. Um, you know, you talked about knowing your boy, knowing the man, and you know, in, in, in our in our audience as leaders, you know, you know who who makes up that audience? Who who are the people that you're speaking to? And and you said something that was you know truly truly important. Know what they're going through, which is you know either you're going to be empathetic to a situation or you're going to be sympathetic to a situation. So here's another little uh, link that I'll drop to you. Literature is getting like super huge nowadays on emotional intelligence. One of the core uh, core foundational aspects of emotional intelligence uh, by Dr. David Goleman. Uh, you can look up his stuff. He wrote, he wrote a book, I think it was in the late 90s or the early 2000s called Emotional Intelligence. Super thick, a lot of psychology stuff in there, but like really, really good feedback in terms of a leader or just somebody who's in an organization which you need to be thinking about. Empathy is one of those things. If you're not going to be able to be empathetic to your audience and understand where they're coming from, understand the experiences that they're going through, then your communication can translate poorly or, you know, get lost in the audience. So if you're going to communicate to your team, that's something that is very, very important. And also, you know, one of the reasons why I, I'm glad the sniper got to ask, and, you know, I obviously have been through stress shoots myself. I put my guys through stress shoots. Um, you know, if you're not creating an environment where you can create chaos and you can practice some of the traditional things that we take for granted, like communicating in this type of space, just having a conversation with somebody. If you don't create an opportunity for yourself to do that under stress and you're not doing yourself justice, you're not doing the team justice. So one of the things I'll leave you with is, you know, to kind of ponder and reflect on as you leave this, leave this talk that we're having is, when's the last time that you did that for your team? When's the last time you put your team in a stressful situation that you could control to make them execute their task, whether it was, you know, one of their Mets, whether it was something like giving a brief, you know, I mean, weapons company, you guys are shopped out to everybody. Um, you guys don't traditionally have your own battle space. Um, you may be given somebody, you know, some sort of support, but you always want the mission. You want to be able to fire the mortars. You want to be able to employ yourself with snipers. You want to be able to shoot. You want to be able to go out there with heavy guns and actually employ your tools to grace your capability. 
but nobody's going to be able to want you to do that unless you can prove that you have done that through a stressful situation and you're going to carry the day. And that initially comes back down to communication. If you can't communicate what you're going to do, how you're going to do it, and how many times you've done it in a stressful situation to do that, then you're not going to be able to get the mission. Uh, I'll use one small, uh, one small story. Uh, so in, uh, in this really special organization that I work for, uh, you know, it's, it's no secret. Uh, you guys saw one of the pictures, you know, I, I did not look like a normal Marine. Um, it was, it was pretty fantastic. Um, I was working with an organization. These guys were given a mission and these guys, uh, part of their mission was a, a, a pretty, pretty difficult free fall insertion. Um, and I, and I got to watch him give the brief to the commander that was going to approve the mission. And this guy was, he was a COCOM commander. So you're talking four star general, right? So he was asking them, he was like, how many times have you done this mission? And it wasn't just how many times they've done the mission. It was how many times have you done the mission? How many times have you done the mission under load? How many times have you done the mission at night? How many times have you done the mission into an unlit drop zone? How many times have you done the mission in this time constrained environment? And so that's how they did their training. They did their training and they made sure that every time they did it, they did it in the most stressful environment possible and they ratcheted it up every time, again and again and again. And so they were able to tell this guy, hey, we have done this mission over 100 times. We have hit our dip, which is our your, your designated insertion point with all members unhurt 96% of the time. That's a pretty good success ratio that they were able to present to a boss but he was able to communicate that in a very stressful environment to a four-star general for a very difficult mission, calm, cool, collected. He knew his audience. He knew what his audience needed to hear. And he was definitely very proud of his guys and very you know, confident in the training that they had done. So the capstone on that is, you know, when's the last time that you put yourself in a stressful situation, put your team in a stressful situation, and how have you continued to ratchet that up and perform? Communication is just only one of those things. If you're not communicating in a stressful situation, then you're not going to become a better communicator. So make sure that you're doing that, whether or not that's given briefs, whether or not that's taking the opportunity to speak on a Zoom call, make sure that you're putting yourself in that uncomfortable situation and getting better at it. Uh, so one of the other things, and I'll go back into this, uh, that last example I was talking about, guy was, you know, we hit our dip this many times, this, many, this much percentage, very, very, awesome the way that they were doing it. They were, you know, some of the most highly skilled individuals ever. Um, one person put down, and this is one of the outliers, I thought I would see this more, but I did They put one of the one of the things that a great team does is fail. If somebody put that down and you remember it, you jump up on the mic. Uh, but in the meantime, why is it that good teams know how to fail? Anybody can answer that question. And how do good teams come out of failure? That a boy. Go get it. Hey, good morning, sir. Lieutenant Kelly, uh, as our two commander. So I put good teams fail. Um, more specifically, understanding like, what a team is. So a team is a group of people. Uh, and the mere entity, the existence of a team, implies some sort of group goal. So everyone's working towards something. Uh, when I say fail, I mean both at the individual level and as a group, people are going to fail. People are not going to meet your expectations. Uh, things are going to go wrong. Uh, and you need to be able to both as a man and as a Marine, the individual level and the group level work through that uh, in a productive manner. So failure does not equ equate to uh, total breakdown in communication and how we run things as a group uh, or how you conduct yourself as a, a human being or as a man. Yeah, that's fantastic. Um, I'll, kind of, I'll, I'll wrap up your comment with, uh, you know, similar to the, to the last thing I said in terms of, you know, communicating through hardship. Have you been put in a situation where you've had to do so? And if so, why not? Uh, the same thing, we go back to the leaders or just anybody um, that's conducting training. If you've conducted training in, you know, again and again and again, and you guys are succeeding, 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 and you haven't reached failure, the question is why? Why have you not failed yet? And if you haven't failed yet, are you pushing yourself in the right direction? Are you actually putting yourself all the way towards the edge to find out where your red line is? Uh, in one of my previous billets, um, I got to do some pretty fantastic exercises, very well-funded um, and very, very difficult. And at the going in of one of the exercises we did, um, the general that was in charge of the exercise, you know, he stood up there and he said, I have one goal for this exercise, and that's to push to failure. I want to make sure that we can push all the way and we understand where our red line is. We can make sure that we find out where the kinks are so that way we actually have to go live and we have to do this. 
we know where we're going to be weak. So the question all the leaders in the room, the question everybody to reflect on is when is the last time you failed? And if it's not recently, why not? And that can be a personal thing. That can be a team thing. You know, like Josh knows right now I'm, I'm training for a half marathon. It's one of the things that, that I want to put a feather in my cap in the next year. It's one of my goals for 2022 is I wanted to do a really long race, longer than I've ever done before. I wanted to experience some pain, misery, and suffering, really find myself. Um, and I haven't failed at something in a long time. I haven't failed at something physically in a long time. I've been very blessed, and I've been able to reach some of the goals that I wanted to reach. So I'm trying to continue to reach and trying to continue to grasp onto something that's going to take me all the way to the edge. And I want to fail. I want to find out where that is, so that way I can find out where I'm weak, and I, I can make sure I reinforce those weak points. That's good. If you haven't, if you plateaued, don't plateau. Continue to try and peak. So, uh, Patrick hey, Lencio, and the yeah, go ahead. So just, just on the communication thing, uh, I'm going to take a different angle and just hopefully frame for the fact that one of the reasons I love this guy is everything he does is very intentional and maybe even subconsciously the things that he's sharing that you guys have drawn out through your survey are things that he desired to do and framed for this very discussion today. So in the sense of teamwork and just bringing a bunch of brothers and sisters in arms together to talk about how to be better. Uh, I appreciate everybody showing up. You sort of had to because it was directed. But I say that a lot. Like, I appreciate you putting on a uniform or wearing, like, civvies until we go into work after this. I say it tongue in cheek, but it's true because it is a choice and a decision. And I think the communication that we either write or that we say to rewind the game tape of where that comes from, it all comes from a thought and a choice and a decision. So communication is absolutely necessary for a lot of reasons he's listed and we could keep going, but you've got to rewind the game tape and go like, where was my mindset and my headspace in that? And like the decisions and choices you make, um, show me your friends and show me your inner circle, man. And I'll show you your actual character and who you are going to become. Put money on it, bet all day, every day. It's a fact, Jack. Like you will surround yourself with someone. And even if you don't want to be like them, who you surround yourself with, you will eventually start to become its nature. Uh, and I think that's really important to go like, hey, this, these communications I have, if I don't verbalize and communicate, whether it's with my voice or written or sharing things, people won't know the expectations that I have of them and that they should have of me. So that whole, there's a lacking peer to peer thing. That's an ineffective team. There's no accountability. There's no layers of like checking each other and being transparent and being concise and precise, like shooter spotter. If you're missing the target, you need an honest feedback of like, Hey, you're missing high to the right. You're this many mils off. If you don't give honest blunt feedback, you're never going to actually hit your goal. And I think in a teamwork, like sitting next to this guy is not ironic because working with my senior enlisted advisor, we are, man, I love this guy and he loves me. And we physically have told each other that man, like, I'm so glad I get to work with you. I love your family. Your wife is so helpful with my wife. Like there's, there's a good family unit there within the work unit, but we have to communicate honestly. And it's not always what we want to hear. And we land on what Doc Rivers said that I watched with some of these guys a long time ago. It may not be good for you. It may not be good for me, but if it's good for the team, it's fucking good. And I think that's where we've landed. And I think that's where my desire would be like the communication is necessary, but get your mind right before you start flapping your gums. And then once you do put your words out there, be ready and willing and eager for that accountability feedback that is so crucial. It's not going to feel good, but it probably is good. Um, I don't know, Tyler, any thoughts on that from you for like just the way we communicate? Because this is like, he's, he'll be a sergeant major very soon. And I have ranked him higher than any first sergeant. And I actually have a profile, some of whom are already sergeants majors. So like, this is one of the best you'll get. So what do you think on communication that we do or just in general? Yeah, I mean, communication is great. It's like, it's make or break. And I think you peel the layers back. It's more than just, because communication can be, a, can be a buzzword. It's like, communication is important. Implicit communication, all this stuff. But like, there's layers to it. It's loyalty, it's trust. Like, there's those, those parts of it that we don't talk about with communication because they're separate. they're separate attributes. But to me, they're not. Like, I give you this information because I'm loyal to the to the company or to the to you as a person or to the team. I trust that this information is going to be received well, and I trust that it's going to be executed well. So, like, communication is a, is bigger to me than just the word communicate. Is 
is it has more layers than that to me. It's, it's Tyler, right? Tyler? Yeah, let me ask you a question. When's, when's the last time that you and Josh had an argument? Um, probably a couple weeks ago. It's, That's good. It the, the, point, it the point I'm trying to make here is conflict is okay, all right? Dissenting opinions are okay. But back to what Josh was just saying, how you're going to present that, how you're going to bring a dissenting opinion, if it's contrarian to what the normal belief is, that's all right. But you need to have the trust. You need to have the culture to make sure that you can have some sort of healthy conflict in between yourselves. You're seeing your top two right there. They're talking about it. So if you don't have some sort of healthy conflict or some way to do that within your team, you need to figure that out because it's all about getting better. So if everybody's just going to be all Camelot syndrome and just say that everything is great all the time, we'll talk about that later in terms of your survey because some of you guys think your unit is freaking awesome. Um, that's not okay. You got to find out where that tipping point is. There's got to be something to scratch. There's always dirt under the fingernails that you need to clean out. So find out where that is. Make sure that you have a process to go at it and just make sure you can talk to each other in a respectful manner and that you can clear that up all about the culture and the culture that you said. And I know you guys got a good culture because I asked Josh about how well your unit's doing. And there are a lot of indicators that show success within the unit. It's not just because of one guy or two guys, it's because of an entire team. So I know it's there. So I'm gonna move on to the next question. Um, so Patrick Lencioni, the guy that I made you guys watch the video for, he talks about life as a team sport. He says exactly what it is. So we're all in this great, experiment called life and it's a team sport no matter where you go you're going to be in a team whether that's a fire team whether it's a squad whether that's your section whether it's your platoon your company your battalion etc it's all about being a team and to be a great leader and arguably everyone in the room should want to be a great leader you need to understand who makes up your team you need to understand that when you're looking at your team how are you diagnosing your team on an individual level and then on a group level to make sure that everybody gels together. So I asked you guys in the survey, who makes up your team? And I wanted you to write down the different people and list them in order as they came into your mind. So here, what I wanted to have happen in the survey absolutely did happen. There were only two people, and there was, I'm going to say two because it's very difficult to see without, you know, identifying it was not a person writing their own individual name down, but there were only two people that listed me or myself. So who were the two guys that said me or myself, or if you listed your name in one of like the groups of four, I'm gonna assume that's a fire team um, or, or some sort of like mini section, who listed themselves as a part of the team, jump on the mic, and where did you put yourself in that list? Did you put yourself first? Did you put yourself second, third, fourth, last? Anybody care to comment? I know you did, Josh. I know you did. So apparently nobody did. So we had two people taking, taking the survey that were just phoning it in. That's fine. That's fine. It's all good. Um, here's, here's another another answer that kind of struck me. Um, and I, I'm going to assume that this came from DeWitt, Scout Sniper Platoon Commander, because he wrote down, my platoon sergeant, my chief scout, my team leaders, the rest of my Marines, my fellow platoon commanders, my company staff, my friends outside of the unit, my family. So he wrote down one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine things. He wrote down nine things. But he never said me. He never said, I am a part of the team. And that's what I'm really trying to drive out here and do it. I'm not trying to dime you out. If that was too cool, if it wasn't, it doesn't matter. It's still going to go back to my point. The point is, is that if you're looking at diagnosing your team and you're thinking of who makes up your team, and as some experts would say, you need to be a very good, you need to be able to do a very good diagnostic of what your team construct is. If you're not looking at yourself first, then you're absolutely wrong. You make up part of that team. And if you are the leader, you make up a huge part of that team. You need to do a self-diagnostic first. Where are you strong? Where are you weak? Where are you most likely to fail? 
Where are you most likely to succeed? What are your strengths? What are your weaknesses? Where do you feel like you need to be scaffolded up by others? You need to do a very honest assessment of that. This is coming down to one of those things I said would be an underlying theme of this talk, which was the I and team. So there's some books out there. You can read them. The I and team, I haven't read them. But when I started putting some notes together for this talk, I thought that this would be a really good thing to bring up just because I started the discussion by talking about reflection. For me, reflection is huge. And, you know, unfortunately for us as Marines, we jump around from team to team to team every couple of years, every few years. And if you're an officer and you've had the opportunity to go to, you know, some resident level p &E, you could be on one team one year, another team another year, and then another team the year after that. So you jump around between teams. You're not necessarily, you know, the guy that's like Kobe Bryant that's going to play on the Lakers for the, for the largest portion of his life. He's been on the same team and he just has people kind of revolving door around him. But you have to do that reflection. You got to find out who you are and what you do for the team, what you cannot do for the team. So that's kind of one of my big takeaways. If you haven't done that for yourself, if you haven't thought about that, then I suggest that you do. Because the sooner you find out who you are, the better your team is going to be for it. If you're a leader, if you're a subordinate, it absolutely does not matter. Figure out how you fit in the piece and figure out how you can amplify the teamwork within whatever organization that you're in. So, not just the individual, you can obviously go back to the team. Lots of other characteristics that make up a solid, solid team. Uh, first portion of the triad that Lencioni talks about is humility. And talks about humility being putting others ahead of you. Uh, I think this is extremely important. You know, being humble, if you're not coming through the door with a humble attitude, uh, then you're absolutely wrong because there's always going to be somebody better than you. There's always going to be somebody smarter than you, faster than you, et cetera. So always be humble because you're walking around a chip on your shoulder like, I don't want you on my team. And one of the teams that I was in where I had, a, I had a huge ego problem, I was dealing with some subject matter experts that were way better uh, at their craft than I was. And I was never going to be able to catch up to them. But I knew that I could bring stuff to the team and some of the experiences that I had, some of the strengths that I had. But I was dealing with these people all the time that were had zero humility, huge egos. So outside of the door that I was working in when they were getting ready to come into my office, I came in one morning, you know, it was right in the middle of the work day. It was probably like nine o'clock. Everybody had been in there. Teams were doing their thing, small teams over here, squads were over here. And I put this 16 penny nail on the wall. And it was like this little sand bucket that I'd found in my kids' sand toys. And I just hammered this thing. And it was an old building. So it's making all these creaky noises, super loud. And I get everybody turn around like, what the hell is this guy doing? I'd only been there for a couple months. They're still trying to figure me out. I'm still trying to figure them out. So I hammer this thing up. I put this little sand bucket on the nail. And then I go in my office. I print out a sheet of paper, take some scissors, cut it out, take some packaging tape, and stick it on there. And there was a big freaking word, bold print, and it said ego. And so I called that the ego bucket. So anybody that was going to walk in my office and was going to talk to me I was telling them, you better drop your fucking ego before you come in this office because we're not going to have a conversation unless you can leave that outside of the door. This goes back to something that Ryan Holiday talks about, talks about in his book, Ego is the Enemy and How Dangerous It Is if You Bring It Into an Organization. That's just one of those you know, colorful things that I feel like I've done in my career that kind of make a statement. Every time somebody had to come talk to me, they had to walk by that thing. When they came in in the morning, they had to walk by that thing. They saw it, and they saw how important it was for me to exude to my team that we better be humble. We better know that we're not the best, but we always must seek greatness at the same time. And so that really just helped out the team kind of get on the same level. And I started trying to see some guys kind of dial themselves back a little bit. And it definitely helped out when they deployed. It helped out in their interactions with each other. And it helped out with their interactions outside the organization. Second thing that Glenn Fieri talks about, he talks about being hungry. I know that there is you know, no shortage of hunger in this room, um, especially coming from your company commander there. I mean, he's probably one of those hungry guys, you know, literally and figuratively uh, that I know, which is why I respect him so much. I mean, if you're going to get biceps that big, quads that strong, you better be eating a lot. So I know he's hungry. Uh, but in terms of his work ethic and in terms of what he does, something like this, setting up a forum like this, I've never done this. I've never created a PME, you know, institutional thing for my Marines where they've been able to receive input from people all the way on the other side of the globe to have some really good conversations. That's fantastic. That's hunger on a different level. And I say, take this one, put it in your green notebook 
and take it to another team because you can always pull in other stuff. You like you surround yourselves with like-minded individuals, right? Josh and I are very like-minded. Um, and if I could say, like, if there were a group of individuals that I would say I want to make as a part of myself, he's absolutely one of those guys. And hunger is a huge part of that. This isn't about being a workaholic, though, right? Yeah. This isn't about being a workaholic, though. Um, being a workaholic uh, at times can be important. You got to put the mission in front of yourself, in front of your family, and in front of some other stuff. But it's just about maintaining that hunger. Having an insatiable appetite, I think, is, is, is the, the biggest part of that. Never doing the bare minimum, always going above and beyond. Third attribute he talks about is uh, being smart. Uh, being smart, he links that back to emotional intelligence. Already dropped that little, little nugget on you guys. Go out there, do as much reading as you can on emotional intelligence. One of the things I think that's very important about being emotional intelligent in a team is much like being physical, you know, you can always get better physically and same thing for emotional intelligence. Uh, I've, I've had the fortunate ability in some of the organizations that I've worked for to go through some sort of testing that tests, you know, your, your cognitive ability, your cognitive ability that you're born with is static. It's going to not ramp up. You can try and get smarter, but you're born with an innate cognitive ability. Emotional intelligence, on the other hand, you can continue to grow that over time. There are certain things that you can do in your relationships with other people, the way that you interact with other people, the way that you interact with yourself that you talk to yourself, both internally and verbally, um, that can help out your emotional intelligence. So you can always grow that. So that's what he's talking about when he talks about being smart. So get smarter. Learn how to be uh, more emotionally intelligent. So I'm going gonna, I'm, I'm gonna to pause there and make sure I don't have any questions before I go into uh, a story. I just brought one story with me. I try to not filibuster this thing with stories from my career and just see if there's anything that anybody wants to comment on before we go into that. Yeah. Hey, John, I'm going to, I'm just going to ask the team. So again, much like communication, what Tyler was sitting on, emotional intelligence can be such a cliche thing that can mean vastly different things to different people, or there can just be no substance of it. So it can be like, Hey, do the thing. And people are like, yeah, track. And I'm emotionally intelligent without a real good framework or foundation of what that is or a tangible way to grow that. So I would say maybe give a quick example of I guess I'll dime you out as well. Like, give me one tangible way that you have identified this is a thing I can get after to make myself more emotionally intelligent. Um, and I would ask you from something that I've observed you doing well, give this in the context to break away from the military team uh, for your family. So pursuant to John Epps as the husband and father, which you do extremely well, and we all got to grow in it. But like, that might give a different lens and perspective that's more applicable to just writ large emotional intelligence and i think that can jump onto other stuff so and then guys if you have anything to add on before we launch i think that's a that's a key thing to focus on but it's it's more than just a phrase like how do you get after that so what you got on that dude yeah so um one of the things that i'm trying to do um and since you talked about family and i you know i opened this thing up with you know one of the goals of this teamwork and the hurt construct that you guys have is just being a better human, I think is, you know, one of the things that's super important about it, inside of uniform and outside of uniform. You spend more time outside of uniform than you do inside of uniform, gentlemen, and one day you're going to take that uniform off and you're just going to be a normal dude uh, that hopefully had a great career that's charactered and colored the way that he looks at the world. Um, but you're going to take that uniform off eventually. Brandon just gave a thumbs up. Uh, he took his uniform off. But I know that his military career has definitely impacted who he is as a person. So one of the things I'm trying to do, you know, emotional intelligence wise, is just listening. I'm trying to be a better listener. And normally when you go into a conversation, I know you're sitting there and you're, as soon as somebody says something, like your brain's going to go off. It's going to go on a, in a different way. You're going to start to judge somebody. You're going to start to draw your own conclusions. But what I'm trying to do recently, especially within my family talks with my wife, is I'm trying to divorce myself of any bias or any pre-existing thoughts that I have about a situation and actually listen to her. Like eyeball to eyeball contact, get truly in and deep on what they're saying. And this is like some pretty fruity stuff, you know, we're talking about here. You guys probably hope, you know, like this guy that I saw this bearded picture of him carrying this super sick kit. Like we're going to hear some really cool war stories and like, yeah, like that's great and all, but that was three years of my career. And that's not going to be the thing that I'm going to hang my hat on when I leave the service. Was it fantastic? Yeah, absolutely. It was fantastic. 
it's built me up in a way that I never thought that I was going to get built up. But it's actually helped me better to be a better human than it has been to be a better Marine. And one of the things that I figured out there, and I've continued on now, is I need to be a better listener emotionally, sympathetically, empathetically to my wife and to those around me. And what I've found is that has definitely helped me build better relationships with everybody that's inside of my circle. And I keep my circle very, very tight in terms of the people that I truly reveal myself to, but then also the people that are on the periphery. And this is something that you need to do, whether you're a subordinate within an organization or whether or not you're a leader. It's arguably more important as a leader, no matter what level that you're on. You need to learn how to listen to your people. You need to learn how to truly get into what they're saying. And if you don't understand, ask damn questions, man. Ask questions and just ask them. So that's where I'll pause there. Thanks for the question, Josh. Hey, Josh, John, uh, I'm going to jump in. I 100% totally agree with you. Um, I mean, so many thoughts flowing through my head. Um, one, as a counterintelligence, human intelligence specialist, my job was to listen. That's what I did. I fucking listened to people. I was able to pull out information while I was doing it, but listening to people was exactly what I need to do. And it goes back to so many other points of what John was bringing up with um, picking up on hot leads, cold leads, uh, but, but also the way people are talking in nonverbal communication. I mean, it is so very important to be able to sit down and talk to someone, but it's even more important to listen to someone because you get so much information from a person because everyone wants to talk about themselves. Um, I had the unique opportunity. Uh, my last duty station was at Wounded Warrior Battalion, uh, Camp Pendleton, California. Um, I was a uh, section leader down there. I had, what, 80, Josh, you came down there, like 82 guys underneath me. Um, some of them sergeants, majors, some of them mass sergeants, some of them master gunnery sergeants who had been there, done that, right? They had been to the war more times than me. And believe me, uh, Josh and I had been there, done that a hundred times, you know, every mew, everything we could do. And just sitting down and listening to their struggles, what they were going through, how they were going through it, and why was extremely helpful for me to be able to help in the treatment of them, whether that was um, sending them to therapy or making sure they got the correct retirement. I'm going to pause for a second. Uh, there is a camera in my view that the flag has fallen, and I would like that fixed right freaking now. Yeah, go do your thing. Thanks. Thanks, Brandon. Yeah. Look at that. Oh, my God. Thanks. Um, Get the paraphernalia rocking. Good Lord. Thank you. I mean, I just received the shirt from Josh, and I'm wearing that Hurt shirt. Um, I know you guys can't see my beautiful bearded face, but um, yeah, that's what I'm talking about, John. Um, so I got my Hurt shirt on. Uh, this means a lot to me. I helped create uh, this with Josh, um, and it means a lot to me. I think you guys are on a path to success, dude. Like, listen to what you can take. I, I know it's hard to take uh, any kind of information and, and, and really, really think about it from seniors or people who have been there, done that. But I'm telling you guys right now, like life outside the Marine Corps is so different, but very, very similar. Uh, as John said, I carried the Marine, Marine Corps principles with me when I left the Marine Corps. I now work for a government contract company. It's awesome. Um, but, but, but still the same thing, right? You know, you know, you know yourself, seek self-improvement. It constantly means something. Um, you, you're constantly being around like-minded individuals who are being progressive in their thoughts, but also progressive in their careers. Um, and I think that's, John has hit a lot of this stuff throughout. And if there's any recommendation I can do is always improve yourself uh, while you're in the Marine Corps because it matters and it matters and it pays dividends uh, when you get out because everyone respects a Marine, but everyone respects a successful Marine. Um, and if you can come out and say where you've been, how you've done it and why you've done it, it'd be super. It, it's excellent. You have to be able to explain why you did something, how you did something, and in the result of that situation, it's, it, you know, an all encompassing uh, formula. And Josh, that's all I got, man. Brad, thanks, Brandon. All right, so since we got 15 minutes left, 
I'm not going to tell my story. I'm going to go into the last thing. I feel like it's arguably more important because I could sit here and war story for days. But if you guys want war stories, come find me wherever you're at. Uh, let's get a beer. I'll be at uh, Camp Lejeune starting summer of this year. And I will be the executive officer of Second Reconnaissance Society. So, hey, John, are we, not, are we not supposed to be drinking a beer right now? Because... Uh, my wife just walked out here and she was like, let's go. And I was like, all right, baby, right, let me right. And like, right. I got my, I got my watermelon lime aha that I'm drinking. Just trying to keep a clear mind. And I, I didn't want to do it. It's like 7 a.m. for these guys. But at least you're, you know, you're on black screen. So you can do whatever you want, man. <laughs> um, it's going to happen. It's going to happen. And I'll, I'll have a drink for all you guys uh, that are out there getting in the fight. Uh, so here, here's the last thing that I wanted to pull up from the survey. I thought this was pretty interesting. And this is like total non-attribution. You know, this was the yes, red, yellow, green conversation that I had. Um, so coming coming off of that Patrick Lencioni video, uh, one of the things that he, he asked was like, conduct a diagnosis of your team. And uh, I would say before you do that, you need to make sure that you have the environment and the culture set up to actually have that be a fruitful thing. If people are going to put that out there, what he talks about afterwards, once you put that out there in terms of HHS, like where am I strong, where am I weak, you need to be able to have that con conversation. And if that conversation has some conflict inside of it, like, hey, you need to be better here, or I can be better here, that conversation has to be had. So I ask you guys within the HURT contract, humility, identity, resiliency, and teamwork, I want you guys to red, yellow, green, so it's kind of tough to get these results back from the survey and kind of make sense of them. But this morning I was going through it when I was drinking my cup of coffee. And he, here's what I take away from that. And here, here were the results in terms of red, yellow, green. For humility, on the red side, it was two. Uh, in the middle, on the yellow, it was 20. And on the green, it was 15. For identity, on the red side, it was two. On the yellow side, it was 10. And on the green side, 25. Resiliency, 1, 11, and 25, and teamwork was 11 and 26 on the yellow and the green. Nothing in the red for teamwork. So as soon as I read that, I was like, oh, man, they're on the yellow and green? Like, I need to find something else to do tonight because apparently the teamwork's, like, all good. So they don't, they don't need to hear from this guy. But that besides the point, I told you guys somebody phoned it in. Here's, here's what I took away. If there's one area that you guys could focus on collectively as a unit, it would be the humility aspect. Because as I stated, and I'll go back to these numbers real quick, humility had the largest yellow out of anything. It was 20 votes for the yellow, 15 for the green, and two for the red. So all of them, lots not in the red. Mostly was in the yellow and green. And I get that. You know, like We all think we're better than we are. Um, that's a problem with being in the Marine Corps a lot of times. People say, yeah, we're good. You know, you go into an AR, depending upon how big your AR is, there might be a lot of, you know, white glove stuff going on. Nobody's willing to take those things off and actually go to battle. If that's the case, and you're doing the AR wrong, and John F's opinion. But not a lot in the red. Uh, but for the humility, it had the largest in the yellow out of anything. So I'm not saying that I need to have like a offshoot, hey, gentlemen, meet me back here a week from today. We're going to talk about humility. You take that as you want. You go with that. Um, and I, I think you might want to redo this, you might take a little more critical look at it in terms of red, yellow, green within the company as a whole, the organizations within the company, and look at that through the HERT construct and kind of take a look at where you really feel like you're red, yellow, green, and actually go critical on it. Um, the, other, the other third of the team uh, I thought was really self-critical. There, there was one third that I thought was really self-critical. And as I looked at those numbers, I was like, all right. How many people are actually giving yellows and reds versus how many people are actually giving the green? Um, I, I thought that was really interesting. So here, here's my theory. Um, the majority, the overwhelming majority of the unit thinks that they've got it. But also, I think the overwhelming majority of the unit is probably the lesser ranks. So I don't know if there's actually a correlation there. It's tough to find out um, unless you actually were to sit down and talk about this. But is that actually true? Like, you guys really think, like, Humility, 15 people say you're in the green. Identity, 25 people say you're in the green. Resiliency, 25 people say you're in the green. Teamwork, 26 people say you're in the green. Is that actually true? You really think you're in the green? And 
On the converse side, the other side, humility, only two people say you're in the red. Identity, two people say you're in the red. Resiliency, one person says you're in the red. Teamwork, nobody says you're in the red on teamwork. Is that really true? And I, I got it. It's only a red, yellow, green. Like you got to be at the right, you got to be at the left. There's not like a percentage in between, you know, we're not, yeah, we're, we're not really getting into the nitty gritty. Go ahead, Tyler, what you got to say, man? So I think you just answered your question. Like we, we struggle with humility. So why do we think we're better at these other three things? Because we're not humble, right? We just answered the question right there. And yeah. I, I, yeah. I, did it, I, I did it myself. I'm green at everything, but humility. Boom. John, I'm, I'm going to, and I'm going to chime in too, because like, in the vein of confirmation bias, which we all own, the majority of the first question you asked for barriers to teams was ego, selfishness. And so the inverse proportion of that reigns true that if you want a successful team, uh, whether that's just the subconscious subliminal messaging that we've done through the hurt model, and by voicing something's important and giving it a metric, it has to become important. So maybe by saying we're gonna start with humility, and also because it's the first letter in the acronym, it's going to physically start with humility. But if that's your starting, acting, and ending posture always, I think it does highlight where everything else is weak. Because ego and self-centeredness and self-preservation, uh, it's such a fine line and balance because it's actually a required thing. Like, I have to care about myself and love myself somehow. But where does that natural necessity become a hurtful self-fascination? It is the hardest thing for any man or woman to manage for the history of mankind is ego and pride counterbalanced with humility. And where do you find that sweet spot? And in there lies the rub man for every other trait that you will assess uh, the honesty and the openness to be blunt with that and allow others to be blunt will make or break you as an individual and as a team. And that is not a shock that that's why we focus on it so much. I know you do in your life with your family. I do in my life with my family from both a personal, professional, and a faith-based reason. There are reasons why others need to be held at the same and higher regard than I am. But I also am an I in team. I am a contributor to this. So it's not self-deprecating, but it is self-awareness. And I think that's, it is so damn hard, dude. And we have to be able yep. to admit that. And I think it's very good that you highlight, like, are you really there? And even the question of, am I really there? And being willing to go back to the start and reassess that same survey by yourself. Like, guys, don't worry, I'm not going to resend it out. But I would encourage you to just like answer it on your own, reflectively following what John shared with us and what you thought about, if anything. And then be honest, man, because it only you will know if it's better for you or not. But I think that's a good start point. But yeah, man, thanks for highlighting that in the Tyler too, because that is, that's the crux of it all, dude. Yeah, I mean, uh... You know, Josh may just say, um, I'm a real faithful dude. Uh, it's a huge part of who I am. It's a huge part of, you know, what makes up my family. Pride and ego has been the fall of so many. So many. I mean, and it, you, don't even, you don't need to look at the good book to find that one out. I mean, you can turn on the TV and find that one out. You can look hey, at what's going on hey, in the world and find that one out. Hey, John, j j just to interrupt, and, and I don't mean to, but um, a great point came up. Uh, what, one of the things that's huge in counterintelligence, pride and ego. It's used every single interview, interrogation, whatever you want to call it, a pride and ego up and a pride and ego down. It's what we use against our enemy to get them to talk. So, I mean, it's, it's an integral part of what we do, how we do it, and how we approach things. That's a very good point. Yeah, I love pride and ego up. I mean, some of the people that I used to work with uh, there were a lot of humaners, uh, interrogators specifically. Uh, they tried to use pride and ego up on me. <laughs> so I got, Dude, I got really it, it, it either works, it either works or it makes you feel like an ass clown, one of the two. But um, you mean 50 50 shot, right? Yeah, yeah, you're absolutely right. I mean, I, I think we're seeing a, uh, a real life play out uh, in Ukraine right now with a little bit of pride and ego coming from Dude. Vladimir. I think that's that's one of the things that it's really good capstone on this. You know, we're kind of back into something that's actually happening in the world conflict related right now. Um, Dude, you know, hundred percent with Vladimir Putin, and you know, how, how do you become the prime minister, the president, and then the president again for what is it, eighteen years, if I'm not mistaken? 
without having a little pride and ego in yourself to continue doing what you're doing. But I'm just saying. That's it. Yep. You're totally there. All right. So speaking of being there, um, you know, we got four minutes left. Uh, I'm going to hold here. Um, if you got any questions, you guys, uh, feel free to send it. I'm going to expect that I'm going to get radio silence. Um, and I'll just close with like 30 seconds of comments real quick. And then I, and I'll leave it if you guys have any questions. So number one, first and foremost, it's my honor and pleasure to be here talking to you guys today. Josh, thanks for asking me. And thanks for giving me the challenge to step up. Always, always, always step up, gentlemen, no matter what. Somebody asks you to do something like this. Even if you don't feel like you got it, find it. Um, because there's people out there that need to hear messages like this. And you've been asked for a reason. So step up and find it. So thanks for this challenge. Thanks for being an attentive audience. Uh, thanks for taking the survey. I hope you guys will kind of look back on that and do a little bit of self-reflection. Um, I always say this anytime I ever give a talk is, you know, once a leader, always a leader for life. Um, you know, Josh is definitely in your network because he's your company commander right now. Consider me a part of the network. If you guys ever need anything, you can reach out to me. I'll make sure that Josh has my, he's got my contact information, but Josh, if anybody asks for it, if anybody's looking for other readings, if anybody's looking for other stuff to talk about, if you guys just want to kick a conversation on LinkedIn, if you want to send me an email and say, hey, you said this, can I get some more info on that? Or this is what I was thinking. If you didn't feel comfortable saying it in a, in a space right here, feel free to hit me up direct. I will get back to you. It might not be prompt and timely, but I will definitely get back to you. And so with that, uh, I'll leave it. Uh, Josh, once again, thanks. Tyler, thanks for letting me bogart your formation for a little bit. And gentlemen, thanks for the feedback that you guys gave during the discussion. Thank you. Thanks, brother. We got uh, three minutes. Uh, snipers, I'll start with you guys. Anything from you? And you got like 30 seconds to spit it. But I want to give everybody a chance if you got anything for major reps. Any questions? All fair game. It's fun. I listen to a lot of hip hop. I'm sure you were wondering that. What kind of music is this guy like? Classic hip hop. That's it. But sir, I just had a quick question. So uh, I think it's easy for us to go out, you know, find things to read, find things to listen to about uh, about leadership, about teamwork, about self improvement. Mm -hmm. um, but I think the the difficult part is then actually implementing that in your life. Uh, so I was just wondering if you have any recommendations or like things that have worked well for you uh, to take what you read and then actually implement it in your life. That's a, that's a very fair question. I was kind of thinking the same thing when I was at your stage. I used to be a counselor, team commander. Uh, but back then, you know, my, my self PME regime was not what it is right now. Um, so, one thing uh, I'll say to kind of tie in some of the things that we talked about uh, number one is you got to take care of yourself. Josh talked about this. I find myself listening to less, you know, music or fun stuff. And reading or listening to more stuff to develop myself so that's number one make sure you're putting that salt putting that stuff into your regime you know as i'm going on long runs or long bikes it's always podcasts or books that i'm listening to not just marine corps stuff not just military stuff but outside of the norm that's going to help scaffold me up as being a leader being a team player being a better individual so figure that out how do you implement that that just goes back into the reflection piece um and then having a conversation so you got a really good outlet. Uh, you got an outlet in Captain Verano. You probably got a good outlet in some of your staff and CEOs. And hopefully you've got a good culture set up between them. You could say, you know, hey, Gunny, or hey, Staff Sergeant, or hey, Captain Verano, hey, I was reading this thing. I really want to use it for some of my guys. If you're kind of lost at how you're going to integrate that by yourself, feel free to ask a question. I mean, hell, you could send me an article and you could say, hey, I just read this in the Gazette. I really want to talk to my guys about this. How do you think I could do that? Um, do the self-reflection though you're first. Reach out to a lifeline if you're thinking about it second. Uh, and then there's nothing wrong with doing exactly what I just did, but just on a smaller scale. Find something that's consumable. Give your guys a little bit of time to get into it. Tell them that you want to have a 30-minute conversation and you want to talk about it. And if not you, give it to somebody else. That's the great thing about being a leader is you're always looking for ways to evaluate your guys. Get an article, something that's easy to consume out of the Gazette, leadership related, war fighting related. Uh, maybe it could be something that's off the beaten path. It's just like better human type stuff with regards to emotional intelligence, self-reflection. Give it to somebody. Say, hey, I want you to have a conversation with the guys about this. I'm not going to be there. I'm just going to be a fly on the wall. I won't engage, but I want you to do it. That's an easy way to kind of integrate it in. 
if you got to chop time into your white space for that, you got to make sure you're not making it too overbearing in the training schedule. So white space is white space for a reason. Don't fill up white space, make a great space. You know, you probably thought about that. Captain Rana can probably fill you in on that if you're not tracking what I'm talking about. But that's yeah. a good question. Thanks, bro. Thanks, brother. Yeah, thank all right, John, I'm going to... I'm just going to land the plane so we can all get about our days. Tell Lindsay and the kids, thanks for giving up hubby and daddy. <laughs> love your family, man. I love you a lot. Really appreciate your insight and just who you are as a man, because I know it's authentic. And Eric, to you, I would just answer what you just asked, John, about how do you get after it? I would say, first and foremost, be real and authentic with who you are. It's good to take other ideas, but however you get after it, be creative. Ask the team how they would like to get after it. Hey, where would you like to start with this? That matters if you want their buy-in, but then be authentic with the way you spit it, man. Hold fast and stay true to your integrity and who you are. And when it comes to where you want to take someone, I'll leave you guys with two things that Tyler and I have talked about a lot, and it's really ingrained in the heart of who I am. Where there's not a vision, your team and your people are always going to perish. Where there is no accountability, your vision will die. So without a vision of where you want to go, you will have no direction from where to go. And if you don't have accountability layered in, your vision that you've vocalized or thought of in your own head will die out because there's no accountability. So, and the key to that is exactly what this dude on my right hand side, I'm sitting left in a breast for a reason because he's senior to me and I'm junior to him. So there you go, boot camp. Um, but the communication is what allows the shared understanding of that vision and the expected accountability that goes along with it. And if you don't have those two fucking things, you will never be successful in life at any capacity individual collective just as a human being so that's just my two cents and if you don't agree with me that's totally cool but i think uh the merit of a healthy company yeah like we're not as good as we probably all think we are but you guys are really damn good you really are and that's very objective and not subjective and that is because honestly you have a dude like this who works with and for me for you all to ensure that that vision and accountability and communication never slips because we don't let it because you guys are worth it. So just take that forward, man. If you've seen it be successful, uh, replicate what you want to have replicated again in the future and reinforce that within yourselves. Uh, John, I love you, brother. Appreciate your time uh, out here, my man. See you guys. I love you. Uh, take care. Thanks, guys.